Hello, welcome back. In the last class we learned that there are situations, like the roommate's dilemma, where there are no mechanisms that guarantee that we can obtain a Pareto efficient outcome. In those cases we say that the first best is not possible. In this class uh, we will ask what do we do in those situations. Uh, whatever is the best thing that we can do, we call it the second best. So let us start by defining what do we even mean by being a better mechanism. We are interested in the class of mechanisms that are incentive compatible, individually rational, and never run a deficit. Among those mechanisms, if you compare two mechanisms, say M1 and M2, we will say that one mechanism is better than the other one if it always generates at least the same welfare and sometimes it generates a greater welfare. So this definition it's, it's similar to the definitions of dominance that we have looked at before whether it was with dominance or Pareto dominance, uh, but in a different context. So I hope by now you are familiar with this kind of definition and I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, we are going to say that a mechanism is a second best mechanism if there are no mechanisms that are better than it. Um, this definition again would be equivalent to the definitions of admissible, which means that it's not weakly dominated, or Pareto efficient, which means that it is not uh, Pareto dominated. Because these are all incomplete rankings, uh, there could potentially be many second best mechanisms. And in the examples that we're going to look at today, there actually will be. So we will have to use all the tools that we have learned so far to try to solve this problem. The first step is that we're going to invoke the revelation principle to greatly simplify the problem and say that we only have to consider direct mechanisms in which each, um, each member of society, each agent, reports the private information that they have, whatever they know, the reports are simultaneous, and then depending on these, these reports, we have an allocation rule and a transfer rule that decide um, what is the social choice that we're going to make and how much each person is going to pay or how much each person will be compensated. The second step that we need to perform is to use individual rationality and incentive compatibility to establish a, a property called revenue equivalence, which says that once we figure out what the allocation rule is, then the transfer rule is going to be completely determined. We do not get to choose the transfer rule, we only have to choose the allocation rule, and that again is going to simplify the problem even further. Then we will use incentive compatibility constraints to figure out which allocation rules um, can be implemented, and as it turns out, it, it boils down to a property called monotonicity. Finally, we would use um, budget balance to impose a little bit more discipline in, in, in the kind of um, allocations that we can implement. And with those, these four tools together, we will be able to find all the second best mechanisms. Now, this methodology is very general. It can be applied to, to lots of different settings. However, in this video and in this course, we're only going to focus on the roommate's dilemma which is a simple enough example to solve, but interesting enough because it teaches us something about general problems involving the public provision of public goods. All right, so let's get back to our now familiar graph in which in each axis we have the value of one of the two roommates, and we can represent an allocation rule by, spe by specifying for which values we buy the machine. The allocation rule that you're looking at here is the efficient allocation in which we buy when it's efficient, and uh, as we established last class, this allocation will fail to be budget balanced, which means that we're going to have to consider different allocations. So here is an example. Um, this is an allocation rule in which we buy in this blue region and we don't buy outside of it. This allocation rule, of course, it's going to fail to be efficient because it's different from the efficient allocation that I just showed you. In these gray corners, it is efficient for the roommates to buy the machine, but according to the mechanism, they don't. And in this round valley, it is inefficient to buy the machine, but according to the mechanism, they do. So whenever the values of the roommates fall within this gray area, the mechanism chooses an inefficient outcome. So let us turn our attention to transfer rules. The same analysis from the last video will, will hold in general uh, mechanisms. In, if we want our mechanism to be incentive compatible, then the amount that a roommate pays if the machine is bought cannot depend on their own report. So what that means is, for example, that along this line, because um, Gary's report is the same, 
then Frankie has to pay the same. Similarly, along the, along the vertical line uh, for different values for Gary, holding the value for Frankie constant, it has to be the case that Gary, uh, if they buy the machine, Gary would pay the same amount. Moreover, using uh, participation constraints and in incentive compatibility, we can figure out what that amount has to be. I'm not going to do the entire argument because it is in the previous video, but I will tell you what the amount is. It is uh, the lowest value that would lead the roommates to buy the machine according to the mechanism. So, for example, um, so how do you find it? Well, you, you start lowering the value for Gary until you reach the boundary between the buy and the not buy region, given by the mechanism. And the point where, where this threshold takes place, that is the price that Gary pays. We would do the same thing to find the, the price um, that Frankie has to pay. So, on their incentive compatibility and individual rationality, we know that payments cannot depend on own reports and uh, they actually have to be equal to the lowest value that would lead to buy. An important thing to notice is that if I tell you what the allocation rule is, then you can figure out uh, what the transfer rule has to be. So that's why this result is known as the revenue equivalence theorem, because it tells us that different mechanisms with the same allocation rule have to have exactly the same transfer rule and therefore generate exactly the same revenue or deficit. Okay, what that means for us is that we only have to worry about designing the allocation because once we figure out what the allocation is, we will be able to derive what the transfer rule has to be. So now let's turn our attention to allocation rules. Here's a bunch of different ones. Uh, in general, they don't have to satisfy any property. They don't have to be convex. They don't have to be, you know, they, they will look however you want to. You just need to specify in which region we buy and with, in which region we don't. The question that we're going to ask now is which allocation rules are going to be consistent with the requirements that we want to impose, specifically um, budget balance and incentive compatibility and individual rationality. Let us begin with an example. Suppose that the value that Frankie derives from buying the machine is equal to 500 and the value that Gary derives from buying the machine is equal to 800. Further suppose that we're considering a mechanism that given these values uh, it dicta dictates that the roommate should buy the machine. If we want the mechanism to be incentive compatible, then it would have to be the case that the utility from buying the machine, taking into account the transfer, is greater than zero. And now let us consider the possibility that the roommates have different values. Now suppose that both roommates have a value of 800, so that the value of Frankie has gone up and the value of Gary has stayed the same. Gary could always misreport and say that his value is 500, in which case they would buy the machine, face the price PF, and get a positive utility. Therefore, if we want Frankie to tell us the truth and tell us that his value is indeed 800, it has to be the case that the mechanism would also uh, recommend that they buy the machine and that the price would be the same. So, if the mechanism recommends that the roommates buy the machine at some specific values, then it must also make the same recommendation when the values go up. Mechanisms with this property are called monotone. And uh, by the same argument that we just used, it turns out that incentive compatibility requires the allocation rule uh, to be monotone. In fact, this is the only restriction that in incentive compatibility and individual rationality impose on, on allocation rules. What that means is that we will be able to implement an allocation rule if and only if it is monotone. In terms of the graph, monotonicity means that, um, that the buy region always grows without limit to the north and to the east. Because those are the directions in which the value of, of one or both of the roommates are increasing. So that gives us a very easy way um, to, to check from a graph whether an allocation rule is incentive compatible or not. We just have to check that from any point within the buy region, you can always move north or, or east and stay within the buy region. All right, let us summarize what we have done. The analysis that we have done so far gives us a complete characterization of the implications of individual rationality and incentive compatibility uh, for mechanisms.
That means that uh, we know exactly what conditions an allocation rule and a transfer rule need to satisfy in order for the mechanism to satisfy incentive compatibility and individual rationality. We need the allocation rule to grow without violence to the north and to the east. Uh, we need it to be the case that roommates only pay a positive amount if they buy. If they do buy, we have to use a fixed price that doesn't depend on my own report. And this price has to correspond to the lowest value that I could report that would lead the mechanism to buy the machine. For example, we know that the VCG mechanism is incentive compatible and is individually rational. Therefore, it's not surprised that, that, um, that it satisfies all of these properties. However, it does fail an important property, which, which is budget balance. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to see how budget balance imposes further restrictions on, on the set of mechanisms that we can implement. Consider, for example, this, the mechanism corresponding to this allocation rule. For this to be incentive compatible, it has to be the case that the prices are given by this dot. Now notice that this dot is below the efficiency line. And the equation of the efficiency line is precisely that the sum of both coordinates is exactly equal to 1000, which means that uh, given these, these fixed prices, the sum of the prices are less than 1000, which means that the mechanism is running a deficit. We want to make sure that this never happens. And one way to do so is to think about what is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario will be given by the worst, lowest possible price that each of the roommates can pay, which we can find it by thinking about what is the smallest rectangle that completely contains the buy region. In this case, we fail budget balance because this rectangle goes below the efficiency line. However, if we were able to, to move this rectangle to the northeast to guarantee that this rectangle is above the, the efficiency line, then this problem would never happen. That is precisely how we are going to characterize the budget balance mechanism. There are going to be those mechanisms such that their enclosing rectangle is completely above the efficiency line. Equivalently, it's going to be those mechanisms that we can enclose above a rectangle that um, is going to be supported um, on the efficiency line. When that is the case, we can guarantee that whatever the values are inside the buy region, the prices will be on the boundary of, 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 um, on the boundary of the buy region, which will be inside the enclosing rectangle. Therefore, the sum of the prices will be above the efficiency line, which means that they add up to more than 1,000, and therefore the mechanism will be budget balanced. So here is so here is the formal statement of the claim. If you take a mechanism which is incentive compatible, then it will be budget balanced if and only if the by region is completely enclosed on a rectangle, uh, which is on or above the efficiency line. We know that um, any mechanism satisfying individual rationality, incentive compatibility, and budget balance will, will generate some inefficiency. For example, the mechanism in this figure is inefficient in the gray area because in that area it would be efficient for the roommates to buy the machine, but the mechanism does not. We can reduce the inefficiency by expanding the buy area inside this green region. In particular, if we stay inside the rectangle, the bounded rectangle, then the resulting mechanism could, would continue to be budget balance. One thing that we could do is we could actually completely fill the rectangle. And as we shall see, that, 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 um, that would result in, in a less, less inefficient mechanism or a more efficient mechanism, a better mechanism, while still being incentive compatible, uh, budget balance and individually rational. So suppose, for example, that the value of, of the roommates is given by this point, um, by this point here. So according to the original mechanism, the, the roommates would not buy the machine. However, with this new expanded mechanism, uh, the roommates will buy the machine, which is efficient to do because we are above the efficiency line, and uh, the prices that they would pay, which are given by the bounds of the, um, of the rectangle, would be less than the values, which means that both roommates are strictly better off uh, with this, this expanded mechanism than with the original one. So this, this expand, expanding the mechanism has resulted in a Pareto improvement, uh, which is always a nice thing. The expanded mechanism is also Pareto improving uh, in the original blue region, because in that case, it, it leads to the same allocation rule, 
for it actually leads to, to smaller prices. Outside the rectangle, the mechanism, expanding the mechanism makes no difference because both according to the old mechanism and to the expanded mechanisms, the roommates will not buy the machine. That means that the expanded mechanism is better than the original mechanism according to our definition. So let us try to understand what this expanded mechanism is. The blue region is a rectangle. For example, in this case, the, the corner of the rectangle is 400, 600, but it could be something else. And the mechanism says we're going to buy uh, the machine if Frankie's value is above 600 and Gary's value is above 400, in which case Frankie will pay $600 and Gary will pay $400. So we call this kind of mechanisms fixed split mechanisms because essentially what the roommates are doing is they are deciding how they would split the price of, of the machine, in this case 600 400 and then each roommate says whether they want to buy or not. A specific example of a fixed split mechanism is the 50-50 split mechanism that we have analyzed before. What we have shown today is that um, all the second best mechanisms are fixed split mechanisms and every fixed split mechanism is a second best mechanism uh, for the roommate's dilemma. So we have completely solved this mechanism design problem. We have found what is the class of all the best things that the roommates could do to decide um, whether they want to buy the machine or not. Interestingly enough, one of these second best mechanism is the 50-50 split mechanism that um, when I teach this class presentially, students always propose, and probably it's also the first mechanism that you would have thought of if, if I have asked you this question before, before uh, taking this class. So maybe this is a problem that we have faced so much throughout human history that we have intuitively developed um, a sense of what is the best way to solve. All right, so that concludes our discussion of second best mechanisms and the topics that I would like to cover in this course. Next week, I will upload one final video um, wrapping up and summarizing the things that we did so that you guys can have a big picture takeaway message uh, to take with you after the course is over. See you next time.